Hello everyone and welcome to week 9 of Psychology of Consciousness. Today we will examine chapter 5 on um, brain, culture, society, those three main aspects, and we will venture into, as the name implies, the connection between brain activity, both in the context of cognition, emotion and behavior, and social applicability. So we will talk about the context, we will talk about the difference between community and society, we will talk about um, judgment, we will talk about inclusion, inclusivity, we will certainly talk about um, diversity, uh, tolerance and empathy. This is in fact one of the central uh, component of this part of our uh, discussion and we will uh, begin by examining a concept that in the book um, is described as mother nature, father nurture. So this is something that um, will require quite a bit of uh, data analysis, quite a bit of um, etymological and um, sociological understanding because the primary things to uh, discuss is the connection between biology and I would say etymology or semantics. And I want to quote uh, Hans Pacher here um, uh, from Quantum Approaches to Consciousness from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, Hans Pacher in 2015 wrote, one rationale for the focus on psychological phenomena is that their detailed study is a necessary precondition for further questions as to their neural correlates. Therefore, the investigation of mental quantum feature resists the temptation to reduce them all too quickly to neural activity. There are several kinds of psychological phenomena which have been addressed in the spirit of mental quantum feature so far. Decision processes, order effects, by stable perception, learning, agency, semantic networks, and super quantum entanglement correlations. So again, our current materialist paradigm no longer is sufficient to describe the mind-body connections. And there are multiple other models of consciousness that um, go beyond that. Um, at this point, uh, old school uh, surpassed, uh, I dare to say, uh, superstitious materialist view. Uh, other models of consciousness include, um, there are not all of them, but I think the list presented in this chapter, it's quite comprehensive, the most uh, common ones. Um, in order of presentation, coalition of neurons, dynamic core and IIT, field models, general quantum mind models, global workspace models, higher order thoughts, HOT, information integration, multiple drafts theory, recurrence models, sensory motor theories, subcortical models, thalamocortical rhythms, internal uh, simulation and self-modeling, including retinoid models, self-model theory of subjectivity, world simulation or metaphor, and others. Finally, uh, cognitive slash cognition attention based models such as intermediate level theory, cognitive and affective, consciousness as attention to memories, corollary discharge of attention movement or CODEM, supramodular interaction theory, multi level feedback, and radical plasticity thesis. Now, for each of these models, please review the textbook. I'm just going to mention a few things about uh, each of these models uh, real quick for this uh, presentation. The first one, Coalition of Neurons, is a model by uh, Crick and Co. of the early 90s that uh, used the observation of 40 Earth's neural synchronization across modules to define the creation of consciousness via feature, um, feature binding to object representation, uh, thus content. So neural synchronization, so oscillation versus coalitions, and feature binding, and tech, which is an attentive attentional process, and, and in, 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 in neuroanatomical uh, functional terms, Unconscious processing in this model mainly consists of feed-forward cortical waves. So conscious processing instead uh, is constituted of bidirectional signal flow standing waves. Um, for each model, I tried to uh, identify some of the issues. For collision neurons, one of the, the problems is that it does not really provide enough evidence of causal factor for the emergence of the self, um, and it overlaps with the same level of oscillation as observed in anesthetized animals. The other one, uh, by Tononi and Edelman, is the IIT, or Integrated Information Theory, in itself, um, together with Dynamic Core and Integrated Information Theory, is part of complexity of activity. 
Now, uh, this is very, very complex, so please review the, the full description there. But um, And I will also include a um, 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 YouTube video link to better explain this one with an interview. But among the main trains of the theory, we find the selection approach to neural developments, microarchitecture, anatomy, and function. So these aspects were first developed independently by Edelman and then um, were uh, implemented with Tononi um, as part of the dynamic core hypothesis. And um, they focus on the complexity and the computational information-based essence of consciousness, as the name implies. So the, uh, IAT suggests that for every conscious perception, there is computational selective discrimination in place, which follows and produces information. So those perceptions are scenes that are integrated and differentiated through quality or, or subjective conscious experiences. So... Um, it, there's an ever-increasing series of information obtained through uh, neural networks. Now, what is interesting is that uh, these changes instead happen in a specific succession, a specific order, uh, but they're still able to maintain a unitary stability. So there is an inside-out and outside-in movement itself caused by external and internal environmental stimuli by neural clusters, which creates a series, a series of interaction. Now, um, uh, the, the quantity of information thereby provides what IIT defines as phi, which is a direct measure of causal interaction within the system, and is thus interpreted as a quality of information. Because again, this differentiation, specification of conscious experiences are produced by the intrinsic value of these variables. Okay, So there are different values of phi that depend on different level of consciousness. Moving on to field models, um, uh, what can we say? Well, consciousness here in this model is equated to the activity of fields, which can be in turn defined as having integrative electromagnetic neural processes. So these uh, electromagnetic properties of the nervous systems are supported um, and um, supported also with some differences in terms of function and synchronicity by Kinsberg and Fagan and, po and, and Pocket. But uh, according to the 2001 model by John, uh, the fields are um, th th these, these, these fields are resonating in a critical mass of neural areas, and they are as perceived in unity, integrity through thalamocortical loops with a global negative entropy creating consciousness, so um, allowing consciousness to um, uh, emerge. Now, since we mentioned field models, very often you might have heard of um, uh, quantum field of consciousness model. Here we talk about general quantum models, general quantum mind models, um, in regard to the hard problem of consciousness. And so, um, real quick, please review the names of uh, Schrodinger, the Einstein, Bohr, Born, Ishikawa, Planck, uh, Heisenberg, uh, Enrico Fermi, Sommerfeld, uh, and, and many others, um, also in connection to the um, Roger Penrose. We mentioned Roger Penrose in the penrose hameroff uh, model. Um, and um, and the, the idea of, of a process that uh, relies on uh, a mechanistic creation from quantum structure, uh, albeit with some lack of detail. Now, similar to this, the global workspace model, which is the one by Barr of the late uh, 80s, is interpreted as cognition, uh, so consciousness as cognition, uh, or cognitive processes that underlie attention, language, memory, evaluation. So, you know, pretty much the same thing uh, as neural underpinning that uh, uh, that in turn can access centralized global uh, uh, workplace. Think about the word by Franklin and Gresser and Duncan and Dehane and Shanahan. Um, so um, the, the, this, this model um, uh, was used to identify multiple sites for continued activity in higher neural center in the brain, um, a discriminating neural architecture to excite a pattern of neurons with long-range cortical axons and a transitional a giant omnicomprehensive neural component of previously disconnected subnatural, respectively. These models, however, again, do not provide enough causal link for the emergence of consciousness, the emergence of this inner self. To continue higher order thought, or HOT, the model by Rosenthal. Um, now, this model uh, indicates consciousness as created through a cognitive-based process via a second-order thought activity about a first-order thought activity, which becomes 
retrieved in the process. So there are sensory processes that are considered to be lower than consciousness, so two different levels. How, however, the most complicated things to explain is the causal effect from lower to upper order. It's also very unclear how attention versus introspection can enter such process. Just, just something um, to consider in, in the context of this inner self, also the subjective self that we mentioned a few weeks, uh, a few um, minutes ago. With the um, approach by Daniel Dennett uh, in the early 90s, we found this multiple dress theory, um, and according to which the consciousness can be better understood in terms of calculating its impact on the system, as this impact depends on neurocognitive content produced in parallel. So consciousness is better from its conscious access in a very mechanistic but also procedural sense. So according to that, um, the, 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 this frame of the brain parallel, Dennett Drew later says time cannot be constricted in a puristic sense since the frame discussed in this metaphor uh, can only be assessed in retrospect. So um, something connected to the work by um, uh, um, René Descartes. All right, the other one that I would like to bring to your attention is a recurrence model by Lam and Pollen. So, as it implies, recurrence of feedback is primary causal factor for holding of activity. This process in turn creates consciousness as neurologically intended to be a correlate of attention and memory, especially short-term memory. Um, criticism, well, many recurring neural networks still do not appear to play a role in consciousness or the creation of, of, of self via recurring feedback as in limbic systems of structure, uh, for instance, the hippocampus, since we're talking about uh, memory. Uh, the model by O'Regan and Noe in 2001, it's called the sensory motor theory, um, as sensory motor skills to be the center of consciousness, so uh, consciousness created by conscious exercise of these skills, uh, so they disregard quality as subjective phenomenon, um, and they suggest that this conscious emergence is pretty much the same as a cognitive perception um, or activation. So, uh, it, one of the shortcomings of this model is that it does not fully clarify how the sensory motor um, contingency could account for every time of perception, um, and more importantly, perception of perception by the self in relation to internal, external, and simulation, um, and also in regard to the mechanistic explanation of the sensory motor cortex. cortex. Now, sensory motors in the context of afferent and afferent neurons and pathways. Um, so, um, this is one of the possible issues with, with, with all these models, the, the lack of clarity and detail. Um, similarly to uh, this, in subcortical models, uh, when we mentioned this before, we talked about uh, Gazaniga, we talked about uh, Jasper, Merker, and Ward. Um, in this model, the focus is on subcortical areas, as the name implies, specifically the midbrain, but also the ascending value system, so the ventral thalamus, the zona inserta, as the locus for consciousness, which is kind of similar to what the car did with the pineal gland, right? Now, in the case of Merkur, consciousness emerges also due to the activity of superior colliculus, while for Ward, the diencephalon, particularly the thalamus, represent the primary aspect of consciousness. Now, this view presents some extent similar theories from psychology, especially cognitive processes as the base for emotions. Um, but according to Ward, uh, conscious experience is supported by this element, neural synchronization, an individual first experience um, the outcomes of cortical computation. Uh, the very function of the thalamus connected to a common brain locus of actions among general anesthetics and as a critical locus of damage into vegetative state. And finally, the anatomy and physiology of the thalamus appears to be a perfect fit for a centralized computer producing, amplifying, controlled computation on a cortical. Now, besides issues of justification of emergence of the cell, how can matter alone justify consciousness? Uh, other issues connected to cognitive psychology and psychology uh, of perception are uh, related to sequence. Okay, think about uh, how we understand. Uh, memory and emotion, which one comes first is the kind of uh, chicken and the egg of problem, right? So uh, think about the Cannon Bard model, the James Lange model, the Shakhtar and Singer model, or the, the, the Shakhtar and Singer 2 factor model with event, arousal, cognitive labels, and emotion. Which one comes first? This is one of the issues that we, we face in analyzing these models of consciousness. Now, to continue, uh, thalamocortical rhythms uh, is the center of another model, um, and we think about um, Linas, Ribery, Contreras, and Pedro Arena, 
uh, on the modulation of the thalamocortical rhythm by the brainstem, a type of gamma band frequencies which are considered to be the origin of this resonance. Now, these frequencies, in turn, caused by two, are caused by two different systems of thalamocortical loops which interact to produce consciousness and disrupt consciousness when thalamocortical dysrhythmia are present. Issues, well, this model of one thalamocortical loop system has specific proje projection, while the other one has diffuse projections. So, just something to, to keep in mind in the complexity of it. A uh, few more, internal stimulation and self-modeling by Hessler in 2002. Um, a simulation-based process encompassing multiple functional activation, including the neural basis for cognition and sensory processes at the core of, of an inner self versus inner world. Um, if, you may, if you remember this, this was uh, quoted by Grosh and Rebonsuo um, in, in regard to the world simulation metaphors. Now, um, Rebonsuo views consciousness as interaction between the environment and the organism. So this interaction is internal and, and dreamlike to some extent. Um, and um, another model is uh, offered by Treehub, which uh, focuses on the perspective of the self, which we could categorize egocentric, not necessarily from, from a developmental perspective, not the perspective of Piaget, for instance. It's more functional, activated, um, and, and allowing the conscious content to be perceived by the self. Um, a close model is the self-model theory of subjectivity by Metzinger, in the sense that everything we perceive is, is in itself a model, a phenomenological-based model, but not really um, ontologically defined as true, true self. Cognitive uh, or cognition attention-based models. Um, think of the one by Sloman and Chrysler in 2003, the correlative discharge of attention movement, or CODAM, um, the cognitive effective computation scheme, or COGAF, um, the model by Taylor, right? Um, uh, there are, at, at this point, some of, of, of these, the CODAM by Taylor, the COGAF by, by Sloman and Chrysler, are, there are some overlapping elements. Um, and, and, there, and there are there are many others. I'm thinking about the one by, by Heikkonen in 2003, uh, the supramodular interaction theory or SIT by Marcella, uh, the polychronous groups by uh, Zhikovic, um, and um, and the global uh, workspace model by Bart. That it's the closest in terms of similarity. Now, Codem is is similar to an intermediate level theory in the sense that consciousness is mediated by a system which is aware of its own world representation in a connective sense. Now, to be clear, regardless of which model is your favorite, um, the main issues here is connected to how we we relate the theoretical model to what we can observe empirically, or, or at least with a certain degree of, of, of um, precision in mathematics computation. And, and a good example in this area would be the research on non-ordinary states of consciousness, or NOSC, within, uh, within medicine, as well as near-death experiences and, and, and comatose states and, and locked-in syndrome. And and uh, but one of the issue is also an issue of uh, I dare to say choosing, picking, and deciding which um, perceptual modality is the most important uh, one. Now, um, one thing I want to mention is the um, perspective of uh, Settle and Lilienfeld in two thousand thirteen. Um, they, they observe that it's not logical to regard behavior as beyond an individual's control simply because the associated neural mechanisms can be shown to be in the brain. So this does, you know, just the fact something is brain-based as a brain underpinning does not demolish um, free will in any possible way. We mentioned this multiple times. Um, you know, the assumption here is that there, there is an existence of an illuminated brain that clarifies everything about reality. So, um, what do we mean by illuminated brain? Well, we mean several things. Uh, a is illuminated because of the functional magnetic resonance imaging of the areas illuminated through, you know, fMRI, right? B, it is illuminated because of the light it shed on this very association, undermining, presumably so, the value of anything non-matter based, because in the sense of of, of, of uh, cl clarification, bringing clarity, and see because it is enlightenment through enlightenment, which again is a a priori decision to reject something that it's not observable or observe according to the previously assumed parameters. So um, it completely rejects any 
true illumination, any true enlightenment, enlightened being, what we said earlier about the buddhichi, the becoming, the Buddha-like, the, the divine light. So it's something that it's really important to, to uh, be very skeptical about. Anytime you hear uh, things such as science has destroyed free will, neuroscience has demonstrated that free will do not exist. Um, scientists agree that um, soul, spirit, and mind are only uh, neural products of the brain. No such thing has ever been demonstrated. Now, you might wonder, okay, well, um, you know, to, to each their own. Anybody can choose any perspective they want. So if, for people that are more materialistic oriented, they can, so to speak, believe in that as long as they use believe as a term. And people that are more transcendental, spiritual, religious oriented, they might be believe in a non-matter-based um, um, consciousness. Well, aside from the fact that this is non-scientific, again, there was no scientific demonstration of the non-existence of a soul or non-existence of a mind. Uh, it certainly does not demonstrate the existence of the causal uh, relation between brain and mind processes. But it has very negative effect in the context of medicine, psychology, and society as a whole. This is exactly where, uh, according to Grof, our psycho-spiritual crisis originates. People who experience these altered states suffer these states, according to modern medicine. Okay, Think about uh, psychosis. Granted, we don't want to... Uh, toss the baby with the bathwater and, and say that everything in the DSM regarding to uh, uh, psychosis and schizophrenia, it, it's, it's anti-scientific. But to interpret that as the only possible explanation is in itself very unscientific. Okay, um, So all these metaphysical uh, transcendental perception that people might go through in the forms of visions, extrasensory perception, uh, I dare to say transcendental features, religious features, uh, they need to be suppressed or possibly annihilated according to, to uh, modernist uh, reduction materialist psychiatry and neuroscience. So modern medicine and modern science emphasize experience rather than talk, a process recently questioned by disciplines such as narrative medicine. Now, this is also important to, uh, to criticize some other position. Think of Sam Harris, quote, The more we understand ourselves at the level of the brain, the more we will see that there are right and wrong answers to question of human values. Well, where exactly? Sutton Lienfeld said that neuroscience is very useful in addressing and answering, from a scientific point of view, questions on neural processes in moral decision-making, but it does not focus on the ethical aspects of this decision. Quote, It is not at all evident how such discoverable facts could ever constitute a prescription for how things should be. So once again, the theory that we discussed at the beginning of the semester, according to which science is about how things work, okay, how things appear to be, not how things should be. There's no prescriptive moral ethical feature, okay? Now becomes evident due to the very science we utilize presumably to demonstrate contrary of that. Science does not account for itself. Certainly does not account for um, a reductionist, even in the context of evolutionary biology origin for, um, uh, for these ethical prescriptions. None whatsoever. And this, again, has to do with our interpretation of the term evidence. What do we mean by evidence? Something that becomes apparent, that shines light, shines light upon the truth. And, um, and this is how we see, not, not only it's true what uh, appears to us, but we learn how to view things. We learn how to look for things so that we, we account for our bias, but we also don't reject things that we would not previously consider to be true because we had false premises. This is connected to another philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, who identifies intersubjective dialogues as indispensable to understand morality or communicative ethics of need interpretation. Um, so value and importance as ulterior to social phenomena, but also social norms at behavioral baseline, uh, sorry, as behavioral baseline and peaceful term to further conflict. So everything we're saying here is connected to society. We're, we're not talking about um, the neural underpinnings of behavior and a connection between um, critical neuroscience and philosophy toward perception, 
just to provide more theoretical uh, precision. No, because this has a strong impact in the way we perceive the world as a whole, uh, in, the, in the way we uh, interpret moral decision making in order to interpret our values. Is there anything that we could know with a certain degree um, of precision that we can borrow from natural sciences, specifically biology, and how does that impact the way we perceive the world in a social context? That will be the very first uh, beginning of this discussion. So let's take a quick tour of history, a quick tour of the way society had interpreted uh, our connection between ourselves, our self-perception, and the world around us. Um, there are multiple ways to do this, and part of our analysis on ethnomedicine, medical anthropology, and the social implication uh, to these fields is because, as we mentioned in past weeks, it is not enough to understand solid biological data to verify how this data actually have an impact in the way we interact on a daily basis with each other. Now, this is also one of the areas of the course where I hope I will provide enough scientific evidence to the way uh, empathy is produced, understood, and shared in order to create a safe environment, in order to create a purposeful, nurturing, and respectful communication level between each other. Now, even if we claim that we are nothing but our brain, as if the brain was not enough, that even in that case, I hope I will be able to display some of the very interesting factors about biology that will shed some light on the often confusing factors that are part of the sociological discourse, especially when that type of analysis clashes with different uh, system of belief. Now, again, mother nature, father nurture. Well, this is a binary uh, labeling mechanism that uh, the books presents and has to do with some assumption that are part of human history. For instance, think about the connection between matrimony on one side and patrimony on the other side. Matrimony, of course, based on the Indo-European root, Roman root, Latin root, mater or mother, and of course, patrimony from the Indo-European root, and therefore Roman, Latin, pater. So the connection between male and female, between feminine and masculine, understood from a neurological biological and sociological perspective. Now, we will talk about genetics, we will talk about biology as a whole, and of course, we will talk about gametes, we will talk about the SRY gene that is very often um, quoted in any type of research on uh, gender and sex and society and self-perception and orientation and belief system and uh, diversity and inclusion. But we will also make sure to um, analyze the very connecting tissue, there to say, in a figurative sense, of course, between everything we can know and we still do know um, from hard science uh, based on years and decades, and I did to say in some ex to some extent even centuries of human knowledge, scientific knowledge, and the current application of sociological factors. So um, this will also mean that we will analyze things such as first, second, and third wave feminism, we will, uh, again, make a comparison between some uh, modernist, postmodernist, constructivist, deconstructivist philosophies and see how much uh, warranted they are in the context of uh, applying biology to society. We will also ask ourselves, why should we apply biology to society or vice versa? Why should we apply sociology to bios, this, to life itself? And is there any discrepancy between perspectives? Can we get a um, judgment of value understanding through science or from science, in other words, similar to what we said about the mind-body connection, is science enough to understand um, this very complex topic, or do we have to push a further interpretation, 
um, a type of heuristic interpretation, a type of either to say apologetic interpretation, where apologetic, uh, I mean that in a theological philosophical context, or the opposite. Should we um, assume that everything that is culturally, sociologically based has to be based on solid science in order to verify what the ultimate truth is? Those are all questions that I would like to address this week and next week. So again, um, this week, week nine, we uh, talked about brain, culture, and society. Uh, and so I would like to begin with the sociological, cultural analysis um, of the application of neuroscientific fact uh, to the discussion. And in the last part of this lecture, I will move on to uh, biology, uh, biology related to uh, the concept of self and the concept of identity. Now, this chapter is quite uh, complex, so I will cover um, chapter five in two parts. This week, we will, uh, again, focus on context and situation, um, part of medical anthropology slash ethnomedicine, although I uh, already included some of the um, external references and videos last week, so I would really encourage students to review uh, those if you're interested in these specific aspects. Um, and um, the third element will be the so-called mother nature, father nurture. And again, I am using this uh, binary uh, metaphoric uh, description of the nature-nurture debate, uh, really, to, again, um, um, specify and, and, um, and defend the connection between social sciences and, so to speak, hard sciences, something that I briefly addressed last week when we make the uh, false uh, comparative dichotomy uh, analysis between uh, STEM fields and liberal studies. We should really um, focus on not so much a holistic perspective in this context, but simply the, the sheer realization that the separation is nonsensical and anti-scientific. So um, using this metaphor between um, mother and father to present a actual, an actual connection between these two. Now, um, this chapter will continue next week with, with cultural, cross-cultural, and transcultural psychiatry, uh, transcultural neuroscience, social neuroscience, neuroanthropology, and sociobiology. Uh, but for now, I would like to uh, discuss a brief um, overview of the social aspects of our um, analysis. And I would like to start by this um, overview of culture. If you remember, we mentioned the etymological historical connection between uh, culture as in the general sociological element, agriculture, cult, cultus, um, 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 and, and, the, and the connection between the identification of self and what lies outside of our self-identification. Now, I would like to mention something uh, connecting self-identifying, um, orientation, understanding, and even uh, self-expression. Now, for, for instance, in the condo psychiatry, one of the things that uh, have changed in, in very recent time is the depathologizing element of um, homosexual behavior slash orientation. Now, keep in mind that the dichotomy between heterosexual and homosexual um, as, as uh, terms were, were also a recent, a relatively recent um, creation by uh, Karl Maria Carmeni only in 1869. Uh, but also understanding how uh, culture plays a role in understanding what is inside the group as opposed to outside the group. If you remember from last week, we mentioned uh, the sacredness of the separation, and I made a neurobiological uh, example and a psychiatric example in uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. So I really value this part of the semester because we are working on inclusion, understanding, tolerance, and empathy for anybody who we might perceive as separated from ourselves. And again, this is in itself connected to the concept of culture, right? So culture as in cultivation, right? As in the uh, Ciceronian from, from Cicero or Cicero, cultivation of the soul. It's, it's something that we grow, we worship, we inhabit, we, we are determined by, and we are determining. So again, this nature-nurture concept of habitat and habitus, where habitat has to do with the place we live, and also from, also from a biological standpoint, and habitus has to do with both the, uh, the clothes we wear and the habit we create. 
Now, the sense of belonging uh, has also to do with uh, sociological examination. And now we will understand that if we are more prone to include a biological analysis. So if we are able to demonstrate with the help of neuroscience and biology, the clear distinction between male and female cognitive processes, now we will have more of a um, warranted uh, belief in the separation between male versus female thought. Although in itself, this does not justify the push toward male versus masculinist or female versus feminist, with the former having a negative connotation and the latter, in this context, having a positive one. And again, this is one of the issues where we have to uh, combine social elements and biological elements. But in doing so, we want to make sure that uh, those separate magisteria are fully understood independently first and then verified in terms of their possible connection because otherwise uh, adding this in this example uh, a european thought as one single framework is simply put you know from a scientific perspective false and again it's false not because it's it's connected to, to european thought specifically it would be false also to to overgeneralize any type of um, uh, African-American black feminist thought as the thought of every single individual who some claim to be part of the group. That would be uh, very uh, oppressive in itself to, um, uh, to claim that everybody had to think the exact same thought. It would be an assault not just on the individual and, and the preservation of self, but also to the individual rights in this context and the right for self-identification um, and self-expression. Now, the other issue is an issue that is connected to the quote-unquote blame game. In, in a course in critical neuroscience, the critical component has to be um, uh, positively and um, um, organically and as much as possible objectively directed. Because the risk is, in the context of separating uh, human beings into groups, um, the, the risk is a further alienation where we are more prone to identify the otherness, the other group, the group of people that either think differently from us or behave in a different way or appear different as oppressors or as um, um, the enemy, which in turn creates an added stress. Now, to give an example in this context, uh, the, the context of alienation and separation from groups and, 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 and the problematic issue with this, um, with the um, group theory is what we find in the current uh, studies on mental health disorder. So scientific research has clearly indicated that the very development of, of disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, but also depression and other mental disorders appears to be linked to the process of alienation and estrangement from the culture of origin of the individuals affected by such disorders. So the higher, the higher prevalence of, of such disorders in, uh, for instance, uh, first-generation Americans or, or, or disorder connected to traumatic experiences of um, immigrants and refugees is in itself an indication of the importance of uh, precisely and carefully understanding uh, what group is and the possible dangers in, again, estranging and pointing the fingers at the otherness, which unfortunately is at the core of identity politics. It, it's an oversimplification that uh, doesn't fully make sense biologically and neurologically speaking, as we examined multiple times, but it has interesting danger even from a sociological perspective. Now, to clarify, the danger is not in this separation between groups it's in itself, because uh, there are certain positive aspects in self-identification with a group, with uh, an ethnicity, a spirituality, um, a culture, a nation, etc., etc., because those are all extension of the concept of family. The danger is when there is a separation between groups, not to have the chance to work on oneself and therefore also recognizing um, uh, problems and mistakes and um, shortcomings of ourselves by blaming the other, the other as different from ourselves, whether the other is simply a person 
person from a quote-unquote different ethno-cultural background, uh, the person belongs to a different uh, political party, a person uh, has different sets of beliefs. Now, we have to work on connectivity, on communication. And uh, this also provides some, um, some positive elements, again, in the context of um, self-appreciation and self-esteem, because we are able to see the other person, again, in a Levinasian term, as the other from me, but connected to me, as a mirroring imaging of myself. Uh, so this is in itself nurturing um, and empathetic in the, in the broadest context of how to create a better world. Wonderful. So uh, let's continue. Uh, transcultural medicine, transcultural psychiatry, transcultural neuroscience, transpersonal psychology, all this transition, all these changes, all this morphing structure, and perceptive discussions on science uh, present very, very different um, suggestions and conclusions in terms of what makes us human. And that's what we're trying to do here because, again, brain, culture, and society are deeply intertwined. Now, I think we already discussed this in depth. Uh, we discussed in depth the dualism versus monism perspective and whether anything can be reduced, as in materialist reductionism, um, or reductive materialism, of course, uh, to basic premises on the basis of pure matter. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, one of the things that you might uh, hear very often, especially when we were talking about um, our sense of self, is, well, you need to get your science right. Once you get your science right, then everything will follow for two main reasons. The first one is that there will be less room for pseudo-interpretation. Um, uh, fake news, we hear this all the time, um, politicized agenda, uh, and so on and so forth. And the second reason is that there is something about science, and by that I mean hard science, empirical science, evidence-based science, that by definition appears very nurturing, very empathetic and inclusive because it's less up for debate. It doesn't really matter where you're coming from, what uh, background you have, whether you're more or less entitled culturally, financially, in terms of socioeconomic status, science treats everybody in the same way. Now, of course, that's nothing to do with the way science is understood from the perspective of, let's say, the problem of evil, why certain individuals suffer more than others, or at least appear to us uh, to suffer more than others. This is something that has to do with, of course, uh, specific branches of apologetics in philosophy. But the idea is this, science is less judgmental, that's at least how it appears to be, in comparison to, for instance, specific philosophical, political, religious, cultural, ethnic factors. Now, if this is the case, um, and of course, I would argue that part of science is exactly about those aspects, and I fully embrace the scientific worldview because of these uh, premises. Now, this will not, however, solve the problem of which one would you pick? What do I mean by that? Well, science, by definition, is not a democratic process. I mention this all the time. So if you're discussing um, integrative therapies, for instance, complementary alternative medicine, um, if on this side you have perfect evidence for the validity, efficacy, effectiveness, etc., of a method, and on the opposite side you have the opposite, by definition, the fact that everything about this treatment does not work, you cannot find the middle ground between these two opposites. Their truth might be only on one side. So it's not democratic in the sense it doesn't really uh, focus on the will or opinion of the majority. Okay? In fact, quite the contrary. Very often it will be upon, based upon the opinion of the minority, a very informed opinion, because again, we want to distinguish opinion from fact, but the judgment, that will be a much better uh, defined term, of a very tiny minority, a tiny minority that uh, has to do with expertise in that very field of science. So this is one of the things about uh, science that we have to take into account. It might not feel good in the moment, but rather than changing the science, we should really change the way how we feel about that. Okay? So this, is, this goes again, um, uh, 
it, it, it's a, again a part of the discussion on which one would you pick. So let's say you have a certain system of belief, whether religious, a religious, anti-religious, or cultural, ethno, political, etc. And according to this system of belief, you might disagree with this scientific premise. Okay. Let's assume um, science says A, I'm oversimplifying things here, of course, science says A, but according to my belief system, this is really B, okay? Now let's assume that you cannot find a middle ground. There's no middle ground between A and B, okay? There's no uh, uh, semi-tonic uh, element, it's not like a vowel, like A and E, for instance, okay? Pronounces A and A, you might find an A, for instance, is an in-between pronunciation, a little point in the abjad perspective. You have to pick between A and B. No middle ground, no possible gray area there. Um, which one would you pick? Well, I mentioned this before when we talked about Aquinas and many other uh, philosophers uh, in, in the, in the you know, Thomistic tradition, scholastic tradition, so on and so forth, even uh, before that, the uh, Aristotelian tradition, Socratic tradition. Uh, if there is a clash between your belief and the evidence, then you got one or the other wrong. I'm gonna oversimplify things here. Let's assume that your disagreement with the scientific evidence is based upon your religious uh, perspective. If your religion, or in other words, the way you interpret your religion disagrees with science, well, either your interpretation of religion is wrong or your interpretation is, of science is wrong, okay? You, you have to make a choice. And in, 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 in neither case, you will find a solution uh, that might appeal to you, okay? Because, again, in this sense, only in this specific sense, outside of politics and, and, and judgmental uh, um, extremist view, only in this sense, science does not care about your emotion, does not care about the way you feel about certain things. You might be just wrong. Now, I really want to stress this point because when we talk about transcultural psychiatry, transpersonal psychology, and so on, one of the elements of um, discussion has to do with the folk component, okay? F-O-L-K, or V-O-L-K in the Germanic counterpart in German, which is this ethnocultural uh, component to the judgment of medicine. For instance, just to give you an example, what appears to be a depressive state in a certain culture might be the norm, the behavioral and emotional norm in our culture. And by the same token, something might appear as very manic, for instance, or, or, or even hypermanic, in one culture might appear just the norm in a different culture. So we have to distinguish perception that are predicated upon either personal or social cultural factors from facts. Now, again, I do understand the difficulties of doing this in the context of neuroscience and psychology because by definition, this field is at the intersection of mind and body. So how can you claim to have a solid fact that's completely removed from your, your personal interpretation, for your personal interpretation, as in cognitive interpretation, emotional interpretation, and behavioral interpretation. It's very, very difficult. Nevertheless, um, we could start by identifying some of the um, overall um, standards uh, in science to determine what we mean by self. Okay? So, uh, let's begin with the construct first. Now, this might be somewhat uh, easy because it's, it's to some extent a review. So, when we think about self, we think about this, this reflection, this uh, reintegration, reforming, reconstructing um, a conceptualization of identity. And of course, with identity, we mean a tautological um, um, semantic sequence according to which I am the same as myself. I identify myself as myself. And this, of course, from a neurological perspective, has to do with everything we, we already mentioned about memory, uh, cognition, time and space, and the fact that I'm able to recognize myself as an individual, as I uh, as, as I verify my essence against the essence of others, okay? So think about as uh, a container and the contained factor, okay? I do understand where my boundaries uh, stop in the presence of something external, okay? And this is very, very interesting. We mentioned this before in the context of 
uh, modulation of behavior where some individuals uh, might struggle more or less in the presence of others. And th this can be predicated upon neurological factors and also the, 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 the sense of belonging and yet separating oneself. Okay, so if you belong too much to the environment, to your community, to your family, to your society, to your culture, then you melt in this culture and your self-perception as an individual disappears because again, you're, you're part of the whole. However, if the opposite is true, where you don't have any connection whatsoever with the world out there, then this might actually create another type of stressor to you because you feel there is no connection whatsoever. You exist in a vacuum. You are all alone. Okay? In, in this sense, you are soulless, we would say in Latin. You're both alone and lonely. Okay? You're completely separated. And if you're separated, of course, uh, in, in the context of mental health disorder, this is a recipe for disaster. You separate, you're, you're annihilated, you are uh, destroyed, you are dissociated, disintegrated. All your parts will uh, disattach from one another. So this is also to do with self. The other thing is that self has to do with this mirroring component. We mentioned already the research by, by Rizzolatti and Al uh, in the context of promoting empathy by virtue of interacting with others, with the other human being, or from a philosophical perspective, the research by uh, Emmanuel Levinas, for instance, and this other, otherness. I understand myself through the eyes of the other person, through the body, through the perception of the other person, and therefore, the more connection, the better, okay? The more uh, appropriate balance between these poles, the better. And so you could view this conceptualization of self as a, as a battery, okay? Two poles, positive and negative. You need to find the proper distance between your conceptualization of self and the external world, despite the fact that you are indeed the world. You are nature too, and that's connected to what we said about uh, you know, uh, ethnomedicine and, and, and medical anthropology. Nature as a term, as I mentioned multiple times, uh, has to do with this ever-growing, ever-reborn factor, uh, natura naturans, we would say in, in, in Latin, ever, ever being born again. Okay? And this has to do with self. Now, one of the main issues that very often we, we, we discuss in neuroscience is what does our brain tell us um, about ourselves? And in this context, we already mentioned that you can pick different directions, the, the cognitive aspect, the, the memory aspect, the, the selective attention aspect, and, and the emotions and the pain aspect, all of this, and uh, for which I recommend you review uh, the, the lecture on, on neuroanatomy and, and physiology. But what does our brain tell us about the labels that we use for ourselves? For instance, um, in the context of identity, orientation, and preference, okay, and behavior, I would say, does our brain say anything about who we are in terms of gender versus sex, okay? Uh, and this is something that is it's, it, it's quite important to understand to, again, promote empathy, to promote inclusion, to promote further understanding. Now, the question remains, however, um, let, let's assume that uh, there are only two uh, ways to interpret the world. One view would be, well, uh, gender is a social construct and is a spectrum, okay? It is a non-binary spectrum, okay? I'm kind of putting things together here to understand it's an over-simplistic view of this perspective. And the other is quite the opposite. Gender is, by definition, binary. It's entirely based on a sequence of two opposites, so it's not on a spectrum, and there is no intrinsic variation. Okay? There might be differences in, in statistical uh, outliers, but it's nevertheless binary, one versus the other, male versus female. Okay? So let's assume there are these two perspectives. Um, what if, again, uh, we're still in the hypothetical realm here, um, there is a clash between what you thought about science and what you thought about, let's say, your philosophical perspective, okay? or religious, or or or, uh, or spiritual, or, or whatever you want to name. Okay, what is it's it's your what you thought of solid evidence-based science, and the other thing, what you thought about your own interpretation of this philosophy. Okay, so let's assume that you are able to study everything in a very very detailed way. 
the question still remains. You have to pick one. Okay. So assuming that the evidence is really against your system of belief, the scientific evidence goes against, for, for, for sake of this argument, your religious perspective. Science, in other words, goes against what you believe as a religious person okay, about this issue, gender and sex. Um, again, what my suggestion will be in this sense, uh, without, without uh, oversimplifying the importance of, of, of keeping uh, validity in all these areas, okay, without pushing too far uh, the notion that all that matters is uh, matter, again, uh, although I, I, would, I would certainly embrace that perspective because of everything we said about science earlier, this, this, this factual based investigation. What if there's a discrepancy between these two? Well, again, you might make a mistake. You either misinterpret science or you might misinterpret religion in this sense. Now, I do understand that this is a very, very complex topic and something that cannot be fully um, discussed in a 15 week course on, uh, on critical neuroscience. But again, since we're talking about mind and body, we cannot really forget about the third elephant in the room, if you remember what we said about the um, dualism versus monism perspective. So you have mind and body, where body means hard sciences, of course, the evidence you have uh, in front of you, the fact. Mind might mean your psychological processes as well as your opinion. The third thing, of course, cannot be you can argue, cannot be directly experienced beside mystical experiences, of course, but can perhaps either be studied or learned through, for instance, theological examinations and apologetics, etc. So that the, the, the probably that, that, that of course might sound dogmatic to some extent. Okay. So let's assume that the the quote unquote dogma of your religion disagrees with the facts of science. Again, you have to pick. Either you misinterpret the quote-unquote dogma, you misinterpret the rules of religion, or you misinterpret the science. Now, uh, what we're trying to do here is to see whether there could be actually an overlapping element between these really three perspectives, mind, body, and the third element, okay? We will talk about the triple S um, model in the next few weeks, uh, um, and uh, and we, we will see why this is important. So the assumption that there was a clash, okay, that at least matter and mind do not match. Oversimplifying, science and belief do not match. But what if they did? What if the issue is more about our personal interpretation and doesn't have to really destroy the notions, rules, regulations, and evidence from both perspectives? Now, of course, this will hit us hard because it's hard to let go of preconceived notions. There's plenty of scientific evidence in, in psychological science about that, that uh, it's easy to go back in time and say, well, I always agree with this if you're proven wrong, rather than say that, yes, I was wrong, my interpretation was wrong, this is actually the truth. Okay, It's really hard to let go of this. Um, but again, what if this clash is only apparent? What if, in the end, there could be a connection between all of the above, mind, body, and I dare to say spirit, in this sense, from a theological perspective, on this very issue, the issue of identity, the issue of self, the issue of understanding who we are from the mind-body perspective, as well as the issue of gender and sex and society and culture. What if that would be the case? So I, I will leave that as a question, and I'd like to venture for now, with a very basic uh, analysis of what we just discussed, so gender and sex. Um, now, uh, rather than uh, starting off with um, a sociological uh, discussion, I would like to start from biology. Um, and there are plenty of ways to discuss this, but a, a good way to understand would be, okay, does our brain say anything about sex and gender? In other words, are there specific uh, valid, scientifically valid parameters that help us distinguish either between a binary structure of gender and sex, as opposed to gender versus sex, or is a spectrum the best representation of what the brain is? And beyond that, is there anything else in, 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 in biology, the body as a whole, not just the brain, that could help us um, 
understand how we can verify uh, a person's uh, gender or sex, okay, before, before we venture into the identity concept. Well, um, let's leave the brain aside for now, uh, although the brain always plays the central role in the way everything comes together, and I admit my bias in this sense, but, you know, if you think about thalamus, hypothalamus, and pituitary gland, it's really hard not to see the brain as one of the main uh, contributors, at least, uh, to, to the way the body works. But if, um, if the question is, okay, please quickly define uh, gender and sex, etymologically speaking, and then see what are the biological scientific parameters to understand that. Let's try to do this in, 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 this, in this lecture. So, etymologically speaking, uh, we mentioned gender is connected to an Indo-European root that has to do with creation, creative power, generativity, right? Uh, gender, genus, genos, okay, so the Latin Greek components, generativity, this, this production, and of course, in this sense, is very much um, a poetic term, okay, poetic from poiein, again, creation in Greek, it's one, a wonderful term, and of course, has also connection with, with, um, with sex in itself, because it has to do with creativity, generation, and therefore, sexual creativity in this sense, okay, creation on a biological sense. Um, sex, it's also an Indo-European term, of course, and, and it's very, very similar in, 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 the, in the way multiple Indo-European uh, languages uh, develop, so uh, sesso, sexum, sex, and so on and so forth, has to do with the Indo-European roots that, that um, is connected to cutting, to separating, again, in, in a binary sense, to separate the male from the female, at least etymologically speaking, okay? Now, we, this is one of the things about, about languages. Languages, uh, by definition, evolve, and, and, um, uh, and the question might remain, so how, how straightforward should we be in accepting either the primary way a word has been used in time past, and how much leeway, how much uh, freedom of interpretation should we have about the way that word is utilized nowadays, okay? Um, with biology, it's somewhat easier because it's directly observable and what was true, I don't know, 100,000 years ago, it's still true nowadays, okay? With words interpretation, things, of course, are also predicated upon a sociocultural influence. So, if the question is, how, uh, how does biology uh, understand sex? Are, are there different methods that biology utilizes to uh, understand and verify uh, what sex uh, a person is. Well, one of the prime methods is, of course, using chromosomes. And we will talk about each of these methods in a little bit. Uh, but, of course, the XX, XY uh, method with the SRY gene is the primary way to uh, interpret sex according to the chromosomes. And the second method will be uh, uh, examining gonads, of course, uh, also within biology. A third method will have to do with, with, with um, the level of hormones, and, and because hormones and neurotransmitters, as we mentioned multiple times, are deeply connected, think about what we said uh, in regard to the endocrine nervous system, these two will have to do with, with the brain. And then, of course, because we're talking about identification of sex, the, the, the last term will be uh, genitalia, of course, so ex external uh, reproductive factors. Now, I only mention these four because they are the most commonly utilized in the context of um, a critical understanding of uh, the conceptualization of self, but then there is a, another uh, fully separated and, of course, yet interacting element on the brain level alone. And this will be the area of uh, understanding how the brain is wired, for instance, front to back as opposed to contralateral, so right left hemisphere, whether the brain has more or less activation in these or that specific areas, and whether this variability can be accounted for on the either binary or non-binary uh, components, uh, whether it's more or less uh, between a female and male subject, and other, um, and, and other neural correlates uh, that are evidence-based that justify differences, for instance, in, in, in um, emotional response and, and, and behavior and, and cognition. So this is just a general overview. But let's, let's try to dig a little deeper into the biology of sex and gender.
All right, so as we mentioned, uh, let's start first uh, by talking um, about chromosomes. Chromosomes as the first model, first method to uh, understand sex. Wonderful. So as usual, I would like to start by the definition with some etymological analysis. The word chromosomes was first uh, utilized by the German anatomist Heinrich Wilhelm Waldeyer and comes from the Greek. Um, soma, if you remember, has to do with body, right? We mentioned that in the um, uh, somatic nervous system. And uh, the Greek chroma, chromic, chroma means color. And so um, color plus body, the word chromosome describes the their strong staining by particular dyes. Now, why are chromosomes related to uh, sex determination in human beings? Well, let's start from sex determination in mammals, in, in placental mammals, the presence of a Y chromosome uh, determines sex. Uh, in general, cells from female contains two X chromosomes and cells from male subjects contain an X and a Y chromosome. So again, XX or XY. Now, in human embryos, something that I would like to remember, um, the SRY gene encodes a very specific unique transcription factor which is activating a testis-forming pathway about... Uh, around seven weeks of development. Now, before this time, the embryonic gonad is, so to speak, indifferent. It, it's not um, uh, specialized, meaning that it's capable uh, of developing to either a testis or an ovary. Now, once this gene product stimulates the indifferent gonad to develop into a testis, that the SRY gene, the testis begins producing two hormones, testosterone and anti-Mullerian hormone, or AMH. Should also specify that... Um, in the early stage, the early embryo has two uh, uh, different system of ducts, the Wolfian and Müllerian duct, and they're both capable of developing to the male and female reproductive tracts, respectively. Now, uh, dehydrotestosterone, uh, which is one of the derivatives of testosterone, induces formation of other organs in the male reproductive system, while AMH, again the anti-Müllerian hormone, causes the degeneration of the Müllerian duct. Now, in female subjects uh, who do not contain SRY protein, this ovary forming pathway is activated by a different set of proteins. The fully developed ovary then produces estrogen, which triggers the development of the uterus, oviducts, and the cervix from the mullerian duct. Wonderful. Uh, the second one that I would like to discuss are hormones. Okay, again, hormones in connection to neurotransmitters. How do they play a role in understanding sex? Now, to continue with mammals, the two main sex hormones are estrogen and testosterone. And these sex hormones have, have a wide ranging effects in the body. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, estrogen is uh, produced primarily by the ovaries, while testosterone is produced by testis. Now, keep in mind that these hormones affect uh, sexual function as well as uh, a variety of uh, processes, um, physiologically speaking, so from brain, blood vessel, bones, etc. Now, since everything is connected, and we will talk. Um, about uh, gonads next. Keep in mind that sex or hormones are also known as um, gonadal steroids, gonadocorticoids, or simply uh, sex steroids because they're steroid hormones that interact with the vertebrate steroid hormone receptors. Now, wh while it's true that um, by definition, male sex hormones are androgens and female uh, sex hormones are um, estrogens um, and, and progestogens, you also need to keep in mind that there are other uh, types of sex hormones. Um, so within progestogens, uh, progranolone, progesterone, nalopragnanolone, etc. Within androgens, um, androstenedione, dehydroprenestrolone, andronastidione, uh, within estrogen, estrone, estradiol, estriol, and, and a few others. Now, of course, progestogens or progestogens, spelled with the A, are in themselves a class of stereo hormones that bind to and activate the progesterone receptor. And, and progesterone is the major and most important progestogen in the body. Now, this is so important um, just to specify the link, again, between the meaning of the word etymology and, uh, and the biological um, structure. Uh, progestogens are named for their function in maintaining pregnancy. So the word uh, progestational. Um, although 
to to be to be uh, specific that are also present in other uh, phases uh, of the menstrual cycles and the estrus. Now, while they're involved in, in pregnancy primarily, the major tissues affected by pro, uh, progestogens include also brain activity, brain specifically, but also the uterus, the cervix, breast, testes, vagina, and 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 the main biological role of progestogens. Uh, is the female um, uh, reproductive system and the male reproductive system, um, and and therefore you know they, they they're involved in, in in preparation of the mammary gland for lactation, uh, regulation of the menstrual menstrual cycle, breastfeeding, uh, following parturition in women, and in men, progesterone affects spermiogenesis, sperma capacitations, and testosterone synthesis. Fantastic. So let's continue with gonads uh, as a third method. This is not a specific order, it's just an order that I like to utilize in, in this lecture. Uh, gonads to understand sex and also whether uh, this distinction and understanding between sexes are only applicable to human beings or to other mammals, other animals, or maybe something else that we will discuss in the next few minutes. Now, talking about uh, the animal kingdom in zoology, uh, gonad indicates as a word the primary reproductive gland that produces reproductive cells, also called gametes. Now, talking about etymology again, well, uh, gametes uh, origins from the Greek uh, word uh, gamete, wife, or gametes, husband, from gamos, marriage. Gonad um, and gender originate from uh, the Greek gone, which indicates generation, seed, and in itself, um, a borrowing from modern Latin gonades, which is the plural of gonad. So again, uh, from gonas um, through uh, gonas, genus, 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 and in Latin genus or genus is, of course, uh, an indicating um, not just seed, but also uh, birth, creation, family, and even an extended sense nation. So gonas, gonas, genus, 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 gender. Um, and uh, so by this definition, it also indicates a type or, or uh, a class, a class of, of noun, for instance, in the case of, of uh, grammar gender. And um, this, this um, indication of, of separation, of distinction is also present in the um, etymological um, origin of the term sex from, from also separating, dividing, cutting through from the uh, Indo-European root. So again, but what, what do they do since they're primary reproductive organs? Um, so gonads are responsible per, for producing the sperm and ova, but they also secrete hormones and are considered to be endocrine glands. So again, the connection between nervous system um, and endocrine system between hormones and uh, neurotransmitters. Just, just to review within tests, so male sex hormones as a group are called androgens, and the principal androgen is testosterone, which is secreted by the testes. Versus thinking about ovaries, two groups of female sex hormones are, are produced in the ovaries, the estrogens and progesterone, and the steroid hormones contribute to the development and function of female reproductive organs and sex characteristics. Moving on, let's talk about genitalia. Uh, as uh, our investigation on sex and gender continues. So to continue our examination, genitalia are sex organs or reproductive organs. They're, they're any part of an animal or plant that is involved in sexual reproduction. Um, in animals are testes in the male and ovary in the females, and of course they're called primary sex organs. Uh, secondary sex organs divided between the external sex organs, the genitals or genitalia, are visible at birth in both sexes, and the, on the other side you have internal sex organs. So again, again, to review everything and bring it all together, the primary sex organs are the gonads, which is a pair of sex organs that diverge into testes following male development or into ovaries following female uh, development. But the, uh, the gonads, as primary sex organs, generate reproductive gametes containing inheritable DNA. And gamete, of course, to continue our etymology from gonos, gonas, uh, is a term uh, that origins from um, the ancient Greek that also is connected to uh, to memory. And again, it is a haploid cell that fuses uh, with another haploid cell during fertilization um, in organisms that reproduce sexually. Now, size, uh, specific biological size, it's also important in our discussion because male bodies develop toward the production of small gametes, so sperm, and female bodies develop toward the production of large gametes, or ova. Fantastic. Uh, last but certainly not least, we will talk about the brain as a whole. This is a course in critical neuroscience so, of course, I would like to pay 
special attention to, to this topic. The first thing I want to mention is that, yes, science has indeed identified very specific um, differences between uh, male and female brain in this context. But again, I want to be clear, uh, this does not mean that those differences are differences in capacities or abilities. But we could identify those differences as variations of um, already present um, functional and structural components of the brain that might justify, biologically speaking, uh, differences in preferences, for instance, in the context of uh, social interaction, um, um, job choice, um, emotional response. And of course, this has a very important practical application in the context of uh, clinical diagnosis and medicine. So it's really important to understand that uh, there is no such thing as um, an um, anti-scientific uh, component in verifying the existence of these factors. In practice, we already identify uh, basic biological sex differences between male and females, um, including size, gene expression, differences in chromosomes, hormone productions, um, morphology of genitals, um, external factors such as weight and height and voice pitch and bone density and muscle mass. But similar differences are also uh, found in the context of uh, neural uh, functions and structures. For instance, there are significant uh, neuroatomical differences that are largely due uh, to the effect of sex hormones uh, on brain development. Um, and, and, and this, of course, uh, indicates that the activity, the expression of genes on the sex chromosomes play a role in, in shaping such differences. Um, on average, to give an example, males and females uh, showed greater volume in different areas of the cortex, which is the, 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 the outer uh, layer of the brain. Females had greater volume in the prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, superior temporal cortex, and lateral parietal cortex, as well as the insula. Males instead had greater volume in the ventral temporal and occipital region, which might also account for a uh, better visual spatial um, performance um, uh, data that we obtain from uh, psychological testing. Now, of course, within uh, functional brain imaging research and, and brain um, uh, neuroimaging uh, studies in general, um, it, it is clear that there are um, anatomical differences that are connected with um, rotation, visual object recognition, um, uh, face processing, inhibition and cognitive control, as well as, as, well as conflict. Um, the, the strongest association was found in facial processing. Another, another important element is that, an, on average, scientists uh, identify that um, uh, females tend to have a significantly thicker cortices than men, while men have higher brain volume than women in subcortical region. And this is important because, in, in general, based on, on studies uh, published so far, thicker uh, cortices are associated with higher scores on general intelligence tests and cognitive tests. Again, we could provide many, many other uh, examples of uh, sexual dimorphism between um, males and females. For instance, the, the third interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus is significantly larger in males, or the fact that in terms of connectivity tissue, um, male subjects um, appear to have a stronger link front to back in comparison to um, um, hemilateral um, connectivity, so between uh, right and left um, hemisphere in female subjects. Again, beyond issues of, of white matter connectivity, um, it is important to uh, understand that um, there are sex-specific differences that could better explain uh, differences between um, uh, male and female um, uh, rates within um, mental health needs, for instance. Um, for instance, women are twice as likely to experience clinical depression and anxiety as men, despite the fact that the, the rates for, for self-harm and, and suicide rates are, are, are very, very different, in fact, opposite, um, where, where men are about uh, three times uh, as likely to suffer from autism and twice as likely to have ADHD in comparison to women. Um, same thing uh, we could say about um, developmental aspect of mental health, where a young male's dyslexia rates perhaps 10 times that of girls, and they are 40% more likely to develop schizophrenia in adulthood. Thank you very much. This concludes uh, Week 9, Brain, Culture and Society, Chapter 5. We will continue with the same chapter uh, next week, because as I mentioned, this is a, 
relatively small chapter uh, in terms of the very pages that um, are dedicated to it, but the discussion is a quite complex one. So we will continue again uh, in week 10 with transcultural psychiatry, social neuroscience, and many other fascinating topics. Thank you very much. See you all next week.